What's going on, everybody? We're back with the Real Bodybuilding Podcast. This is episode number 78, I believe. And I got Mr. Phil Viz with me, one of the premier coaches in the IFBB and amateur ranks as well. How are you, sir? Doing all right, brother. How are you? Good, man. How is coaching going for you? It's going great. Um, you know, got a full roster. I don't really have any room for anybody right now. So people sending in inquiries, you know, there might be a little wait because I usually get them when I do a podcast and I get an influx of them. But yeah, you know, I, again, I screen who I come, who take, who comes in anyway, because I just got to make sure we're a good fit because, you know, I'm pretty much an asshole. So I hurt a lot yeah. of people's feelings. I want to, <laughs> I, I know I've heard that about you, <laughs> about you, but oh, yeah. I, I, I do the same. So it's okay. But um, before we get into the coaching thing, I want to get into how you got into coaching because you were a competitor before. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't a great competitor, honestly. Even yeah. I'm gonna be honest. Even the stage pictures that you guys see, um, one of the reasons why I don't post progress pictures and I don't like people taking pictures of me until stage is because I know my angles. You know, yeah. I'm a very good poser for who I am. Yeah. So I know where you're sitting, where your vantage point is. So yeah. I know how to pose to you, so I look good to you. But if yeah. like you're sitting over there, I look like shit. <laughs> so you say you're not a great you weren't a great competitor but i just see some pictures here i want to show everybody kind of who you were in case you, in case you guys don't know who phil is or don't follow him go to his page it's phil underscore viz uh this is his, you know personal page and he's got a lot of his clients on here too but uh these are some shots of you i believe yes sir yeah i wouldn't say that's a bad competitor man that's these no, are, good, these no, are great I'm shots not, i'm saying i'm not like your level you know like i'm not yeah. Like if I, I, I think that I could win USA, I could win nationals, but I'm not going to win any pro shows, you know? Yeah. 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 Like it's just not going to happen. Like I, I might be able to squeeze into a top five if nobody shows up in a pandemic or some shit, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for the most part, like you could see, I posted these pictures actually for a reason to show the difference between over dieting for extreme condition or finding a balance so on the left. Yeah. Uh, you can see my glutes are in, they're not peeled, but they're in. Here, my yeah. shape looks a hell of a lot better than on the right because I over dieted the shit out of all my muscle to get super peeled. You know, I was a little yeah. bit flattered, you know, Sean Roden and Flex Lewis, who were the Mr. Olympias that year, both messaged me and said, holy fuck, you were peeled. But yeah. I, I, I didn't have any shape. I had no pop, you know. I can see the difference. You see, for people, for people watching who don't know bodybuilding that well, you see the difference. Like, one of the main differences I see is the depth of the striations. Like, you see the depth of the striation in your glute versus here in your hamstrings. Um, you see the hardness through the chest and the stomach. It's not as hard here, but it looks, to me, it looks better on the yeah. left. Yeah. And that's why I've always said, that's why I've tried to make the point when you, when you're coaching a competitor, it's your job. You're, this is one thing about coaches. You can't really teach. Uh, I think Chris Aceto does a great job with this. You have to have a discretion on how lean you can get the competitor before their muscle starts to look like shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you could be, you could be, say, 5% less conditioned, but an overall better package for you and place better because you held your fullness, you held your size. Listen, people, people make the mistake of thinking when bodybuilders and pro bodybuilders come into a show that they're not super peeled. Of course, listen, they're pro fucking bodybuilders. Every one of them can get super peeled if they want, but what's yeah. that going to do to their muscle and their look, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a You've got to find that balance, and it's rare that you get like a Phil Heath, Sean Roden that can do both. Yeah, that's a really good point because I remember working with Hani back in the day. I think in 2010, we did a show and he was trying to get my glutes shredded, but like, you know how it's sometimes it's easier to get them shredded from the side and then the bottom and then to get them shredded all the way around takes a little bit more, right? Yeah. So he was waiting for the top of my glutes to come in and they just wouldn't. And we kept dieting and my legs kept getting more and more and more streamlined. Yep. And so after that, those shows went by, he said, look, your legs are going to go before we get your conditioning right. Mm -hmm. So you have to grow your legs all off season so that we can push you harder at the next show. And then even at the next show, even though my legs were bigger, there still came a point where he was like, look, I'm not pushing you any further. We're good where we are. Yep. And, exactly. And, and that was the flex pro and my conditioning was great, but he wanted to go even further, but he made the judgment call as a coach. Cause he's a good coach. He said, look, this is going to be a better look than if I push you further and everything gets flat. Yeah, and, so. and, and, and you have very few bodybuilders who can keep their like, complete fullness and size and still get that peeled. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of these guys, like they're looking at condition monsters, like, monsters like, a, like a Lucas Alsali and people like that. 
They're like, oh my God, his condition, his condition, his condition. Yeah. And maybe it, is, maybe he is one of those people that can hold his fullness. But maybe if you looked at pictures four weeks out, he might have looked better. Yeah, yeah. A little bit mean. bigger and fuller. Yeah. And then I know you come into these shows, and you've got to remember, you're still lean. You're still going to be hard. You're still going to be full. You're still going to be separated. So what if the guy next to you is five percent better condition? If he doesn't have your muscle mass, you win. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It's a, it's a culmination <laughs> of criteria. It's not a conditioning contest. Yeah, you have to play. The, you have to walk that line. What do you think? Do you think that's the situation with Rami? Because Rami seems to be one of those guys who's, you know, people always say, well, why does he just get shredded? Why does he just get shredded? And I'm like, maybe he's playing the game you're talking about. Maybe he's saying, I want to look well, this way. Honestly, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> this is going to be a very unpopular opinion. People forget when you uh, mass inject synthol and things like that, that it has calories to it. So I think that he uses a lot of oil, like a lot okay. of the guys over there. And it boosts your calorie count and he's constantly fighting against, you know, bringing his calories down. I, okay, wait, let's go. Before we get back into Rami, I want to touch on that because that's a really good point. I didn't know that using synthol, and this is probably a really stupid thing on my part, but I'm not an expert. So anyway, when you use synthol, you're adding calories? It depends on what it's made up of. It's not going to be completely made up of that. You know, yeah. like if you have like a teaspoon of uh, olive oil or something, it's like 16 grams of fat. You're not getting a full serving of fat because there's other things in it. Like yeah. uh, I'm not a, I don't know what they mix it with, but they put like painkillers in it and they put, um, you know, different fillers in it and things that mm -hmm. thicken it and all these kinds of crazy things. But the fact of the matter is, there's oil like even when you're injecting your gear it's in grapeseed oil right or something That's like true, that yeah. yeah you are your body absorbs it where does it go it just doesn't it doesn't disappear your body metabolizes yeah. it That's so true. you're getting yeah. calories i didn't even realize i didn't even think of that most people don't i i yeah. I, I, I tend to pay i tend to figure out a lot of things that most people don't because i didn't have the best genetics yeah and it's actually funny one of my best friends made a good point because I said, no, if I was a really good bodybuilder back in the day, I probably wouldn't have figured out all the things that I did. And he goes, sure. so what you're telling me is you traded a career you would have made no money for, for a career you make a lot of money for. I was like, all right, good. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, it's actually, it's funny you said that. I actually know, and I'm not going to name any names, but I actually know a couple really, really good bodybuilders that don't even know how they got there because they're just genetically blessed. Right. So that's, that's, and even, and even my, how to get arms. no, and even myself, like I was never like at the top, top, but, uh, there's probably a lot of things I never picked apart and tried to analyze because it came yeah, easier you than know other people. What? I, I've watched you since the mayhem days. Yeah. And I watched you all the way through all. I watched you from when you were an amateur and then everybody's like, Oh, flaws going to turn. I watched you from the yeah. very, very yeah. beginning. And wow. you were always just what we call a doer. If you say you're going to do something, you fucking do it. And it's, yeah. there's no chance of it not happening. So yeah. you have that work ethic that kind of sometimes bowls through genetics <laughs> yeah, yes. it does it does like I've, I've i've seen guys that you know make coaches look good like back in the day i had this kid um i, I actually he actually came back to me he left me for, because we had like a disagreement he came back his yeah. name was mike charles okay. and there's nobody that can't get him in shape because yeah. he works his fucking ass off and these yeah. guys make you look good as a coach yeah because yeah. Anybody can prep them because they're going to kill themselves to get in yeah. shape. And they're, and like, they're not even going to think about looking at a, a gram of carb over. They're not going to measure the scale at 9.1 if you say nine ounces. Yeah. Like, yeah. so you guys got people like you tend to bowl through bodybuilding. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually true. But I just, sometimes I wish I would have, like you said, like you took more time to figure things out. And now well, I'm I doing it. I didn't have a choice. Yeah. The, the cool thing is I'm doing it now with the podcast, so it doesn't matter. But I want to go back to Rami because it's really interesting. Do you really think that that – do you think that's playing a major part in why he's not shredded? Oh, boy. I'm going to get fucking raped for this. But, but you're used to getting shit on for stuff you All say. Right, so. No. <laughs> I, uh, I trained Rami back in the day. I was supposed to work with him. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a other people uh, playing a part in his decision and whatnot. Um, let's just say I poked the body part because I was curious yeah. while we were training it. And I felt scar tissue. Okay. So. But could be from gear though. I mean, listen, it takes a lot of fucking injections to get a lot of scar tissue to feel, to be able to feel it. I mean, I have scar tissue like in certain Yeah, bodies. but those are from the same spots that you inject over and over and over, upper outer glute, side delt, yeah. things like that. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get it all the way down a muscle belly. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> like, and, Maybe, and yeah. distinctly, it's like the muscle's not going to feel like a rock. A lot of these, a lot of competitors now are injecting body parts and losing lines. One of the main ones that people do now, the popular one is injecting your quad sweep with Synthol because people I've don't always, have But I've always done quad sweep, but with gear. Like I don't, I don't. With, no, with, no, I'm talking about with oil. Yeah. They're so injecting, happened, but I thought, okay, sorry. I, sorry I keep interrupting you, but now I have a whole bunch of fucking questions. So I thought Synthol was going to be useless for a body part that big. No, not when you do it all the way down the fucking leg. <laughs> So you just what are you what are they doing like one or two three They're mils doing like all three the way? They're five two season like four spots all the way down the leg multiple times. Well, fuck if you if you're talking about calories now, that's yeah, that's that's a big thing. That I know a competitor. I will not say a name. You don't have to say that, names. That one USA. Yeah. That used twelve bottles of painless pumps for their prep. That's fourteen hundred cc's. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but the fact of the matter is you'll see like a lot of deformities in the quad sweep now, a lot yeah. of these competitors, but here's the telltale sign. Some guys just don't have separated legs, right? That's true. Yeah. Well, we have the teardrop, the VMO. Yep. We have the rectus femoris, the top part that makes the V. And yep. then we have our quad sweep. Yes. When your VMO is, sw is separated from the, from the, from the center muscle, right? But your quad sweep is not, <laughs> that means the muscle's not fully flexing. <laughs> Okay, let's, oil. let's say let's say sometimes because you don't know if that's always true. Not all, no, no, no. There's no such thing as always. Yeah, true. yeah, but, but it's for a, the it, most part. When it's you a sign. See a deep line through the VMO, and then there's no line on the quad sweep. Yeah, that's a problem. There's oil in there. Yeah, yeah, that's a problem. Huh? So the oil doesn't flex. Do you? Th so do you think? Let's say. Let's assume you're right, even though we have no proof. But let's assume you're right. Let's say. Let's say Rami's doing a bunch of whatever oil, synthol, whatever you want to call it, you think if he pulled it all out, he would have a different look at the Olympia? Yeah. Huh. And I think not only that, I think that, see, Ronnie has so much muscle mass, like you said, he can afford to lose some of it. Yeah. But the problem is they always try to keep him big, 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 and then rely on diuretics at the end. Is and that what they that's do? That's why he comes in flat. He could lose a little muscle, and still come in full and look hard. If you're flat, you're not hard. But why do you think he's had like four different coaches and nobody can figure this out? Or nobody can convince him to do it? I think part of it is nobody can convince him to do it. I think that he's got multiple people in his ear. I think that, and this is another, this is one reason why I don't like to take on veteran competitors that are pros. Yeah. yeah. Because they have a little bit of an ego about themselves. That I got myself here. I'm the pro. Yep. I won shows. No, so, you're right. And, and I've heard this, I can't, countless times, I have a lot of top coach friends, yeah. I have a lot of friends in the industry, tell me you haven't heard this. Oh, this guy sent me this, but that doesn't make sense, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Why the fuck did you hire him then? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, look, I'm a veteran pro. If I did another show, I do have to agree with you in one thing. It's not that, like, for example, I had Patrick send me a diet. Because I was just curious, right? I'm like, let's see, maybe we can work together. Patrick Tour? Yeah. Yeah, now he's a smart guy. Yeah, great, great diet, right? Why would you not listen? It's not that, well, I'm not ready to put that 100%. For that, the, only, the only reason is because I'm not in that place in my head. I got business things going on, whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is, um, as a veteran, it's like you're used to doing something for a long time. And then all of a sudden, somebody wants to change it. And you're like, wait a minute. And it's not that I would ever say I know more than Patrick or know more than any coach. It's just that you get used to doing something and you're like, this is the way I do it. You're comfortable with it. You trust yeah, me. Yeah, that's but right. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. You're a year older. Yeah. Your body might have changed a little bit, right? Yep. yep. You're never going to follow. The, you, did, have you ever prepped on the, for a, with, for the, uh, with the same diet twice for a show? No, no, no. It was always a change. No, yeah. Because yeah. it always yeah. changes because your body changes and you're at yeah. a different point. Yeah. Um, also have to consider he may see or know something that you don't, in which point it's no problem. You should ask the coach. Yeah. Now, if the coach can't explain it, Mm -hmm. that's a problem yeah i agree you know I agree. there should be no because i said so or just trust me no <laughs> give me a fucking explanation one that i can understand because also i very much believe in a lot of times they'll say oh well you wouldn't understand the explanation bullshit because yeah. if you are educated enough and understand it well enough you can make sure anybody understands it yeah that's true so let me ask you this then so when someone comes to you and they have all these preconceived notions, how do you break them down? Or do you just say, I can't work with you. You have kind of stuff already lined up. It, it depends on what I think their ego is. See, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of my clients come to me 
with stuff that I always, it's a big thing that I always say. It's like, like it's a popular thing. If you ever follow my stories in my page, I say, please stop reading the internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. back in the day, we were on forums. And if somebody posted yeah. something incorrect, everybody ripped them apart. True. Yeah. Now people can post wrong shit all over the fucking place. And if they don't like, and if you try to save, they just delete your comment. Yeah. Yeah. They'll, or they'll block you or something. Yeah. Like they'll block you. So like, there's no correcting bad information. I can go make a web page right the fuck now that yeah. say weed is better than chemotherapy. And you can't tell me I can't. Yeah. But the counterpoint to that is, don't you think that there are, there's a lot of different forms of information. Like your, is, your perfect it, information might not be the same as somebody else's perfect information. I agree. But see, the, the, the problem is, the, the big problem in the industry is people don't know how to identify what's right and wrong right now. That's but what, but what I'm saying, if there's more, what if there's more than one right? Because you know as well as I do. There is more than one right. There's always the thing, more than yeah. one right. Yeah. So, so go ahead. But it, depends on, it depends on who's building the picture. You can't take different pieces of a puzzle and make the picture. True. You can't take a piece of that puzzle and a piece from that puzzle and make a, make a picture. True, it doesn't true. work. Yeah. So you got to listen to one person 100% because the reason why B might be working is because of A being in place. And without yeah. A, B doesn't work. I see what you're saying. So you, I can't listen to you and this guy and that guy and form a plan. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's got to. It's it's got. It's got to all sync. And that's why when people message me and they're like, "Oh, can you just do training for me, or just do nutrition, or just write me a drug stack?" I say no because they all have to sync. I see. It seems to be that's the way it works with most of the. I shouldn't say that actually because Chris Aceto is a good coach and he doesn't do any training or anything. But most, most coaches now seem to be like they want but to do I everything. Think that, I think that – but I know that Chris has long phone conversations with the people. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure he's aware of how you are training. Yeah. And adapts the nutrition to the way you are training. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So he, oh, he does take that into consideration. He just doesn't write it for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. So let's say you get a client that comes to you. What's like one of the main things? Let's give, let's give people some X's and O's. What's the main thing you see people doing wrong when they come to you? Oh my God. Let's say somebody, um, I'll, I'll narrow it, I'll narrow it down. Cause it's the winter time. So people are, people are probably bulking. Uh, let's say somebody comes to you and they want to get big and they, they give you your diet and they, they're like, this is what I've been doing. What's the main thing you see people are doing wrong? Precision. What is Everybody's that? everybody is so random with the food they're eating. One of the things that I hate the most, I can't stand when people say this, this is something that's been parroted that one person heard it. Now it's a fucking echo chamber here. Okay. What's up? Is, if you're not growing, you're just not eating enough. That's not true. <laughs> That's because, me. That's me. <laughs> because you've got, you've got different factors like sensitivity. Like, listen, if you're 20% body fat and you're not growing, your problem is not eating enough. Your problem yeah. is your body's not sending the calories to the right place. Yeah, that's true. That's different. Yeah. yeah. So I, I probably, I'd say over 50% of the time when I get people, I cut their calories down and all of a sudden the scale's going up and they're like, how is that possible? Yeah. Law of thermodynamics and all that bullshit because yeah. fucking morons who are just stuck to fucking science and paper spout that out. Yeah. You yeah. know, law of thermodynamics. No, the food's not going to the right places. Yeah. So I'm very big on nutrient timing, amounts, things like that. People say, oh, how many calories are we looking for in a day? We're not. I look at each individual meal and decide what you need at that point in the day. Okay, so that, that's going to counter contradict a lot of other people which is fine oh yeah but i want to ask so let's go back to the body fat thing first and then we'll get back into the nutrient timing when you're if someone comes to you and they're let me actually let's ask it this way at what point is somebody too fat to be bulking like at what point do you look at somebody and say we got to burn some fat before we bulk well i got that depends on their questionnaire i have a big long questionnaire intake form so first one of the first things i ask is how well do you put on muscle and how well do you put on fat what if I'm that a, gives me an idea of what your body type is. But what if I'm a beginner and I don't know that? I'm coming to you. I'm a beginner. I look at. I came to you. I'm a beginner. I, I'm like, seventeen percent body fat, and I want to put on muscle. Well, I'm gonna look at the amount of muscle that you carry. I'm gonna look at your fat distribution, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's always an individual thing because some guys just have to get really fluffy to get big. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Whereas other guys won't put on any muscle if they're fat. So it's going to be an individual thing. And, and from the very beginning, it's going to be, a, if, if they're a very beginner and I don't, and they can't really give me good feedback, it's going to be like a, it's going to be a trial and error guess and check thing at the beginning. Yeah. And then I'm going to have to figure that out. 
But if they have a good idea, if they lean more endo or they lean more ecto in this and that, then that's going to determine what I think about the situation. And mm -hmm. then we go from there. Okay. So, so, so let's say I know this is a tough thing when I get really good coaches on the podcast because really good coaches and scientists can't give, can't speak in generalities because there are so many different types of people. Yeah. But for the sake of the podcast, I'm going to try and give you another scenario and maybe you can just give me a little bit of general information just so people can uh, kind of well, establish on their own. Right. So how about this? Throw me a scenario and I'll just address that, that specific scenario. Same scenario. I'm a beginner. I've come to you. I'm 17% body fat and I want to put on muscle is my calories. And let's say I'm eating, I, I want to bulk. I'm eating 3000 calories right now. And I weigh 250 pounds, but like I said, I'm 15 to 20% body fat. Am I going to be cutting my calories down or am I going to be increasing my calories from that point? Like what I'm asking is, cause I get this question so much from people, Hey, I'm already kind of fat, but I want to put on muscle. Should I lose the fat first or should I just add food and, and grow into it? All right. Well, first things first, people have a misconception on what percentage of body fat represents what looks 17%. I wouldn't say is super high. I'd say it's high, but I wouldn't say it's super high. Yeah. Just like I would say most people shredded on stage are more like 5% or yeah. 4%, not, not 2%. I agree. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. So like a lot of people have a misconception of what body fat is. Now, if you have somebody who's 250, he's got to be reasonably muscular. So you've got to consider his ratio of fat to muscle. That's right. So he's got a lot of muscle. He's also got some fat, but because he has a lot of muscle, his metabolic rates a little bit higher. His muscles have more requirement. So he's probably going to be partitioning a lot better than somebody at the same body fat who's 200. What does partitioning mean? Partitioning is simply this. It means sending the food where we want it to go. So okay. when you're leaner, you partition better. When you're fatter, you partition worse. So okay. say I eat a thousand calories and I'm really fat. So I might have 50% partitioning. So 50% is going to fat and energy use and 50% is going to my muscles. Yeah. Now, if I was, say, 12% body fat, I'm probably going to get more like 75% or 80% to the muscles and only 20% to energy use and body fat. Okay. And it's, so it's going to be relative to what your body's needs are. So because we got to remember is, and this is how, this is a simplification. Mm -hmm. When you get leaner, yeah. your body is hungry, right? Yeah. yeah. And you're training. And there's not as many calories to go around. Mm -hmm. So your muscles are the priority. They're, and your, your, or, your internal organs and your, your bodily functions and your sure. muscles are the priority. Sure. Fat is storage. Fat is emergency. Okay. You're not going to stock up your emergency store before you, you, know, before you feed it, before you do everything. That's right. You're going to eat the food before you stick the rest in your cabinet. That's right. That's right. So the leaner you are, the more it's going to get, the better the, your partitioning is going to be. The better is the partitioning is. So what happens is if I can get somebody leaner, yeah. then the same amount of calories actually are going more towards muscle or going further. So okay. a lot of times I won't even change a bulking diet if, I'm, if they're leaning out yeah. for like a good two, three months, because if you're 250 at 17% yeah. and you're eating 3000 calories and then you're 250 at 12%, well, those same 3,000 calories are going further. Yes, right. right. That's Because right. your muscles are getting more of it. Yeah, yeah. So there's no need to touch it. So the, the answer to the question in general, general terms is you want people to be leaner to make more progress. Uh, re with, as lean as they need to be to make progress. Yeah, don't, not like... Don't get me wrong. I've got yeah. people that got to be 20% body fat to get big. Okay, how do we figure that out? Because some people freak out. Like I have, like I coach some people and they freak out when they start adding some body fat. And I'm like, we have to add a little bit of body fat to get you to where you want to be. And people just really don't understand that concept. Well, here's the thing. It's, it's more of a situational thing. And getting fat to put on mass is always going to be my last resort. Yeah. But if what I'm doing is if keeping them lean has not really got them moving, I'm going to move the calories up. How do you, you know? make, how do you make that determination? Let's say you got a guy who's pretty lean and you've been, coaching him for a few weeks and you don't see like what determination is it that where you say you know what we're gonna have to start packing on some shittier okay so performance in the gym. so is it strength or what is it 
It's everything. See, a lot of people have that progressive overload thing all wrong. They think it's just wait, wait, wait. Progressive overload is anything that's harder than the last time. That's what Agreed. progressive overload is. Yeah, that's true. It yeah. could be more reps, more sets, time under tension, bad form, deeper reps. It could be more sets. It could be more volume in a shorter period of time. Okay, so let's specify it. Let's say, are you looking for something like, let's say his bench is stuck at 225 for eight reps. He can't get any more reps. He can't get any more weight. Then he's stalled. And he's kind of like that on all his exercises. Is that where you're stalled? He's got then he's stalled. He's either he's either overtrained, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's my answer most of the time. My solution ninety percent of the time is take a rest day or take two rest days yeah. or take a week. Yeah, yeah. And I think Branch Warren was the one who said the hardest thing for bodybuilders to do is back off. True. Yeah. He said yeah. people don't know how to rest. So where so let's say they take the rest, but so where is it? Where is the indicator where you're like, you know what? We need to add 300 calories. We need to add 400 well, calories. The first thing I'll do is take a rest day. Mm -hmm. I'll run bloods, make sure that they're healthy. That doesn't work. Calories have to go up. Calories go up, doesn't move. Calories go up again. But as long as the calories are in the right places, where I feel based on my style now, there's going to be many different styles. Yeah. You know, yeah. you could have three different coaches that can grow a guy three different weights. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So based on my style, I know where your baseline is. Okay. So I'm going to continually work that up until I see a response. Okay. So where, okay, let's go back to nutrient timing then, because now we're, you're trying, you're going to add some calories, but you're not adding them across the board. You're adding them specifically in certain places. Specific do, spots. Yes. Where do we, cause other people, you know, I've had other people on the podcast that are like, look, it doesn't fucking matter. You just got to eat the food. It doesn't matter if you can eat it all in one sitting or eat it in seven sittings. That's not necessarily something I agree with, but, it's, it's a theory. I don't agree with it. So where is, how does your nutrient timing system work? Is it kind of like John's where it's centered around the workout or is there other things you look at? Priority always goes to performance for the workout because okay. without performance in the workout, you have no stimulus without no stimulus. Your body has no signaling without signaling. You don't build muscle. Okay. Okay. So you have to create the signal. If nobody calls the cops, cops aren't coming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta create the stimulus you got to create the, the signaling in order for anything to happen. So everything goes priority workout performance. So pending where they work out in the day, I'm going to rework pre-workout nutrition first. I'm going to make sure when you're coming into your workouts, you're full, you're loaded, you're feeling good, you're stable, and you're ready to perform. Okay. Can we pause on that one for a second? Because we're, I want to go through these one at a time. Uh, I hope you don't mind giving too much information. No, I don't, I don't mind. Because maybe somebody might actually formulate a diet from this. But No, listen, uh, listen I'm a very strong believer in, 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 in sharing information. But what you have to remember is you still need the person that knows how to use the information correctly. That's right. I, I, yeah, the value of a coach is you, you can't just take a diet and run with it. But So let's go back to my philosophy on pre-workout. And this, we might vastly disagree here. But my and philosophy, we might both be right. <laughs> my my philosophy on pre-workout nutrition is my, my pre-workout meal is actually my smallest meal of the day now it's my second meal of the day so i usually have a big breakfast but i don't like to feel really full when i go in the gym i agree so what is your what is like a what is your pre-workout like what are you doing with the pre-workout that's so important. i like a bigger pre-workout meal but i space i space it further from the workout Oh, okay. And so I, even I even specify that in programs. So how far from the workout? On your pre I will write on your pre-workout meal no yeah. sooner than two hours away from than your two hours away really? from the workout. Yeah. Really? Okay. So tell me, tell me what is a what's a what's a typical? I want to know how big we're talking. What's a typical pre-workout for someone like me? What well, would you say? I go with easily digested foods. So the typical pre-workout in my programs is Greek yogurt and cream of rice. Okay. Simply together? because we they both digest quick as fuck. Yeah, but you're not mixing them together because that'd be gross. No, 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 no. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. But I also use I also use a specific brand. I use light and fit Greek yogurt because it's half the cap it's half the carbs. Half the carbs means half the lactose. True. Okay. So okay. I don't want that disrupting digestion. Now so, is that is that it? Just those two? You're not adding anything else to that meal? I I mean, listen, depending on the person's metabolic rate, I might might add in some peanut butter if I think they're gonna blow through it. I might yeah. I'll adjust the amounts. Yeah. Um, but what you have to consider is I also am looking for optimal intra-workout effect because I like intra-workout drinks. Yeah. And what yeah. people have to remember is if you have food that's still digesting in your system, it's like a traffic jam. I know. Yeah. What do we want from intra-workout? We want fast transit, right? That's right. But if you have food in front of it blocking it, you just ran into a traffic jam. It's not getting through you fast. So it's going to bloat your stomach. It's not going to work. You're going to feel like shit. And guess what? A lot of times what you'll find is if you check your blood sugar post-workout, it starts going up. Why? Because it never digested. 
Okay, so wait, before we get into intro workouts, is two hours too far from a workout? I feel like it's too far. Absolutely not. Because I might, I might, I might do that on a leg day because I want to be completely empty, for lack of a better word, on a leg day. But I feel like two hours is a long time. Well, here's the thing: you're going to use an intro workout, right? Yeah, I don't mean I don't mean for catabolic reasons because yeah, I'm going to use an intro workout. So there's essential aminos in there. So you and still all have you still you still have nutrients. You still have fuel. But is it? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, I guess it's, yeah, there isn't, there isn't any reason why you wouldn't do two hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. See, the thing is now it's, di- now it's already broken down. It's digested. It's through yeah. your stomach. It's probably in your intestinal tract. Yeah. So your stomach is ready to accept the initial workout. You know what I find funny? And it is a little not off topic, but I saw a guy training the other day. He was on the shoulder. He was on the military press and he was eating a protein bar. <laughs> I'm like, I'm yeah. Like, and the problem, I see it. I see it all. The, I see it all the time, yeah. man. That's another problem with having to digest food during your workout. Say you ate an hour pre-workout, right? And yeah. you're still digesting that food. Well, you're drawing blood to your intestinal tract and your stomach away from your muscles. That's right. So that's going to impair performance. Yeah. Yeah. But you I know? feel, I feel like an hour is okay because I'm like, I feel like, you know, a smaller meal, say chicken and rice. I don't do a ton of it. I do like six ounces of chicken, a couple hundred grams of rice. And it, I feel like it's digested quickly. Well, yes, well, so. because you're eating a smaller meal, you don't yeah. need you don't need the time to digest a smaller meal oh, like so that, you're, like you would a bigger meal. So the reason you're doing two hours is because so how much cream of rice am I eating? So um, somebody your size, I'd probably go with three quarters of a cup, which would be about a hundred grams of carbs, plus the yeah. Greek yogurt, which is going to be like another thirty to forty. Yeah, that's not huge. But uh, it is, yeah. So you're looking at so you're looking at about 40, 45 grams of protein, and you're looking at yeah. about 150 grams of carbs. Then what I like to do is I have people have a little snack on the way to the gym. I always give my I always give my clients a little snack, something digest, something processed, something enjoyable. It tastes good. Like it what? boosts serotonin. It puts you in a good mood. Makes you want to train. So the, my big thing, everybody here knows this, is Rice Krispie treats. Oh, I love those. Those are good. Cr- so I, so <laughs> I have. <laughs> like you, for example, I'd have you eaten three to four of them on the car ride over to the gym and then start your, start your intro workout. Insulin or no insulin? Are you an insulin? I'm not an insulin guy. I don't, I don't like insulin, but I'm assuming with the Rice Krispies, it probably fits. Well, it depends on, it depends on again, what the person needs. And yeah. like a lot of times I'll only use insulin on body part days that need to catch up to the rest of the body, or mm-hmm. I'll use it on all days if I feel like they need an overall growth spurt. Um, or, you know, or I might not use it pending their body type and their response. So, so it's always going to depend. Do you have phases where you might use, and now we're going on to a different topic before we go back to intra workouts. Um, do you have a philosophy where you might use insulin for like two weeks and then stop? Or is it either like once you start using it, you're going to use it for a few months? See, here's the thing. A lot of people think that, you know, you become desensitized to insulin and then you have to come off and it's no longer effective, but that's also going to go back to your sensitivity and your, your body composition again, okay. because uh, if, if constantly using insulin fucked up your sensitivity, we have a lot of dead diabetics or diabetics running a thousand IUs a day, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Cause so I, we don't, but, do that, we? but I, but I'm one of those people. I, I feel like after two weeks, cause like the first couple of weeks I get this, like, crazy pump i'm like fucking insulin is the greatest thing on earth and the reason i hate it is because every time i've tried it after two weeks i'm like okay now i'm just getting fat i don't feel it i don't feel that's that's i don't don't feel anything i'm just sweating my ass off and i'm getting fatter by the day well the reason why you're the reason why it's not working anymore is because you got fatter the rest of the diet wasn't organized properly okay so if if you if you're using insulin, you want to really really focus intensely around the peri workout period, pre, intra, and post. Yeah. And then I use the other parts of the day to kind of bring calories down a little lower. And I always have zero carbs on off days. I see. See, a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. I I use my off days as not only higher protein, essential fat recovery days. I also use it for sensitivity and composition body fat days. See, this so, is, see, I'm going to show you, I'm going to share something to you with you is to why I'm such a bulking fucking freak. I used to always use my bulk, my rest days as extra food days. You see that works for, that works for ectomorphs. I don't think that would work for somebody like, because me. I, because I always felt like when I was training, let's say you're doing like a three day on one day off, two days on one day off. Right. I always feel, felt like by the time I hit that off day, I was not depleted, but not as fresh as I was on the Monday. 
So I would eat more food on my off day so I could come back uh, Friday and Saturday and kill it. Well, I'm going to show everybody a little trick here. I'm going to throw a little twist into this. I'm going to give away something that I like to do. But uh, on a lot of off days, I have your final, final meal as a cheat meal. Okay. So, so that's your refill. you are still loading up for the that's next That's your refill. Day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's just I have you zero carb all day starving, resensitizing. Yeah. And then that cheat meal just ends up filling up your glycogen stores and not making you fat and you're ready for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, okay, so going back to the diet. So we found, so your pre-workout meal, you figured out, we figured that out. Then we have our intra workouts um, that are, I feel the same way you do. I feel like it's an important thing. Carrie's, actually, you tell me the reasons why you think it's important. I'm not going to tell you what I think. <laughs> Sorry. <right>. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. Listen, I, think, yeah. I think most people understand that the, the premise behind intra workout is to fuel your workouts and you have uh, an enhanced amount of blood flow to certain body parts. And, you know, because of that, that's where more of your mood nutrients are going to go. Yeah. And if you have a lot of glucose in your bloodstream, you're going to replenish, be replenishing glycogen as you train instead of running out. So instead of the tank starting to empty, the tank's actually staying full while you're training, you can get better performance out, you can get more volume out, which is going to in turn have a better response and better feedback and better recovery. Now, uh, like our, our intra workout has essential aminos in it. So a lot of people think an intra workout was just carbs, but I don't necessarily think because I know you're with HD. Yes. And our both of our pre workouts hostile and HD are kind of similar. Yeah. Uh, and they have essential aminos and they have Pico two and those kind of things. So are those, I feel like those are really important because I formulated they are. ours. They're very important. So the essential aminos, I feel like it's like an anti-catabolic effect. Absolutely. Yeah, no, okay. absolutely. Absolutely okay. correct. Um, what you've got to remember is that anytime that you're training, um, especially if you're training correctly and you have a lot of time and attention and such, uh, you know, when we're training, we get that burn, that's lactic acid byproduct buildup. Anytime you have byproduct buildup, the response to that is an elevation in localized growth factor response. So you're actually having an enhanced growth response during and after your workout and everything. And it's important to have those aminos readily available to start the repair process. So that's so, okay. So that's definitely the reason for the intro, but now is that also why the post-workout window is so important because we're in that heightened state of, absorption here's the thing i don't think that your post-workout window is such a rush i used to believe that but i don't uh, think that people should do it anymore but is that yeah. because okay i agree with you but only because people are taking the intra but if somebody's not taking an intra do you feel like the post is still important yep. i'm going to explain it to you so okay, hit me here's here's the thing a lot of people are rushing to their post-workout meal right mm -hmm. now this is going to go up but i'm going to explain it you have your PNS and your SNS, right? Okay. Your What's parasympathetic that? nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system. Okay. So your parasympathetic is rest and digest. It means it wants to calm everything down, bring all the blood and energy away from the muscles and yeah. into your digestive tract. Yeah. You have fight or flight, which is your SNS. So when your body does that, that's why we throw up during workouts. Our body's purging everything because all of the blood and activity is to our muscles and our body doesn't want that liability in our stomach. Because mm -hmm. thinks we're fucking running from a fucking saber-toothed tiger that's going to eat us. Okay. So <laughs> um, they go like this. Yeah. So when one goes up, the other goes down. Yeah. So we're training so hard, our fight or flight is up. Yeah. That means digestion is down. Okay. So after the workout, it might take a while for this to come down and for this to go up. That's why you okay. can't eat after leg workouts. Uh, I was just going to say, is that why I'm not fucking hungry? Yep. So when I'm not hungry and I go home and I force down a shake, is that a bad thing? Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of um, initiating the shift to go back the other way, yeah. but it's not there yet. Okay. So your better bet, especially if you still have an intra in your system. And yeah. I also, here's another one. I had my clients go home and check their blood glucose to know whether it's coming up or going down. Um, but if your blood glucose is stable and you don't feel like you need food immediately, Give it 15, 20 minutes. Sit down on the couch. Put your legs up. Relax. Mm -hmm. the, the worst thing to do after a workout is go rushing around running errands. Uh, okay. Why? Sit down. Let your body calm down. And when your body's ready for food, it's going to tell you. So if I have stuff to do after the gym, I should do it all before the gym is what you're saying. Either do it before the gym or sit down, wait 20 minutes, eat your meal, then go do your stuff. Okay. Okay. All right. So what is the next most – is that the most important – the most important meal in your nutrient timing throughout the day, your pre-workout? 
pre-workout intra post is going to be the most important. Yes. Okay. What is my, what is a, the, the ideal post-workout meal? <laughs> well, I mean, listen, I, it's not, it's not rocket science. What I give my clients is vanilla whey, use it as milk and cereal. Yeah. Okay. What kind I of... even do that. I even do that in prep all the way to shows. Like a cereal, like a Rice Krispies or Fruit Loops. Or yeah. Something. Anything something... you want all yeah, the way to the yeah. show. So listen, I tell my, my clients, motherfucker, you're in prep. You're on fucking Rice Krispie treats and eating cereal. If you need to cheat, you're a pussy. Quit. <laughs> yeah i mean it would be a treat every day i've never you're done cheating that. every fucking day but i think people i think where did that get popular was it because dallas did that what the 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 cereal the cereal oh got no i've been I, there's pictures on my fucking facebook from like 2008 no no no, no, no. I'm, history treats. I'm not i'm no no no. i'm not saying you i'm i know there's people that did it before but for some reason i remember a couple of years ago it got really popular to have cereal. And I think it was because Dallas was doing it or somebody. There's, I can't remember. there's, there's always going to be some, this is, this is a, honestly, this is going to sound a little uh, selfish, but I hold a lot of information back because my platform wasn't always the biggest. Yeah. And I would constantly see people that follow me that have big platforms, start throwing my information out. And all of a sudden they have the credit and it's like, motherfucker. <laughs> Happens you know? all the time though, man. Like right now, everybody yeah. is uh, right now. Everybody is on a uh, neutral, neutral, neutral bar, uh, neutral handle deadlift which is a hex bar deadlift you know a yeah. trap bar deadlift yeah, yeah, yeah i started those on the hammer strength machine back in like 2008 and now all of a sudden everybody's doing them but the problem is they're all doing them wrong why are they doing <laughs> okay you're gonna you know you're gonna get flamed for this right that's okay i'm fine because you know what i'm right and they can come on here and debate me anytime they want why do you look okay wait first <laughs> okay i'm gonna i'm gonna be a commenter for a second why do you think you why do you think everyone's copying you? Why couldn't people just do hex bar deadlifts? No, 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 no. I don't think they're copying me. Yeah. I just think that I've done it for a long time. Yeah. And a lot of the people that are doing it now are very much aware that I used to do it. Yeah. And I've posted explanations. So I, listen, it's, it's nothing is nothing belongs to somebody because listen, I think like, you know, they said Larry Scott invented preacher curls. I don't think he was the first person on earth that did preacher curls. Yeah, it's whoever who popularized it. Whoever makes it popular owns it. That's the thing, right? Yeah, no, I know. And that's why I hold on to a lot of my shit. So, but... I, so there's, a, there's a thing I call a hoss row, which I thought I was the first person to do, but I think Flex Lewis actually did it first, which is, it's actually a pull down. It's when you sit uh, reverse on an incline bench. And you do a pull down. So you're leaning into it, right? And you do the pull down that way. So you set up an incline bench in front of a pull down station. And you do a pull down kind of leaning against things. So I thought that was mine. I'm like, I did that. And then all of a sudden I start seeing it everywhere. I'm like, oh, they copied me. But then I realized half these people don't know who the fuck I am. So it's yeah, like. No, I did, I, yeah, I was doing that back before there was even social media. So nobody could have even seen me do that. <laughs> tell you. The same one. <laughs> all right. So. No, no, but to your point. Yeah. A lot of people probably have come up with it on their own. That's right. Yeah. But uh, as far as the trap bar deadlifts, they're standing straight up and their hips are under them. They're doing a squat. It's, uh, it's like literally by the time I can even demonstrate this. <laughs> Wait a minute. Want, no, no, no. You don't have to demonstrate. This is what I'm going to do. So, uh, watch. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go like this. Uh, who, can, who can we – Hunter to Hunter does that a lot, doesn't he? Uh, no, not the trap bar. Not the trap bar? No. He does, he does rack deads. No, I, f I thought I've seen him do the trap bar too. Oh, I didn't see him. Do or maybe it. It was, maybe it was James. Let's see what James is doing. I'm pretty I, sure James did deadlifts traditionally also. No, I know, but I think he used – I could have swore he – or I don't know, was it Ben? I don't know who the fuck it was. Well, I can help, I can help everybody just understand real quick what All to right. look for. All right, tell me what to look for. It is the fact that they're pulling from too high. Okay. By the time, every, you know, if you're trying, if you're trying to target your lats, yeah. you're not targeting your lats doing this. Okay. So they're getting their hips under them and they're pretty much straight up and down by the time they go to pull. Right. Yeah. So what muscle is shortening and driving that, driving the weight up? It's your quads. Wait, wait, I figured it out. It's Nick. Nick has been doing it a lot. Walker. Yeah, he has. So I want, and I don't want it. This is not to flame Nick at all. I just need somebody. to No, give me, I'm, I'm friends with Nick. I respect Nick. He's yeah, I just, I, I just want to kind of. People have a hard time, and I have a hard time understanding unless you can see it, right? So, okay, so here he's using the. So you're saying he's standing too straight up at the beginning of this? Yeah, look, look, his his the line of pull is not in line with his lats. He's driving with his legs, and he's pretty much just going straight through his traps. So this is quads and traps. So how how should he fix this? Uh, he could keep his knees a little bit straighter and he could 
make his torso go more horizontal and he could get his hands in the line of pull in line with his lats. So, being, so he's got to, he's got to, he's got to drop that down about six inches and get less bend in the knees. And the, and the, um, the, the um, flexion needs to come from the hip, not the knees. But wouldn't that be more of a stiff leg deadlift then? No, because you're pulling through your core. You're not, the weight's not, the weight's not situated out in front of you. Oh, that's true. It's about your sides. Yep. Interesting. So more bend and straighter no, and straight. Less, less, less knee bend. No, no, no. I meant more. Sorry. I meant more bend from the hip. So yes. being bent over further. Uh-huh. And, and, then, and then less. Lower knee. handle. Yeah. You need, you need to be pulling mid shin with your ass up in the air. Yeah. I was going to ask you at the beginning, would it help if he stood on a little box or something? Well, the whole reason that I came up with these is because I felt deadlifts load your waist like a motherfucker. Yeah, so yeah. by pulling up through your core, you're negating that. Interesting. So if I want to deadlift, but I want to make sure my stomach doesn't get, get any bigger than it is, I should do those. Yes, absolutely. Huh, that's a good tip for people because a lot of people love deadlifting because deadlifting is such a, it feels like it's such a instinctual lift. Like people just Yeah, but the thing is when you start to struggle with a deadlift, you feel your obliques pulling, you feel your lower back. Obliques yeah. are a muscle, they grow. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you force obliques to support 500 pounds, guess what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So post-workout we're doing cereal with protein powder, but that's going to be pretty fast. So are they eating soon after that or still a couple hours? Hour and a half to two hours. Again, I have them monitoring their blood glucose. As soon as it comes down, they're ready to eat. Do you have them check their blood glucose all day long? No, just in certain key instances when we're using insulin or when we're trying to monitor certain things like the Perry workout window. Okay. Um, I've, I've explained this before in the past, but what you have to remember about blood glucose is First of all, there's a pro we have we all have a real clear example. When we go hypo, what happens? You're starving. Yeah. So and when your blood when your blood glucose is high, you're not hungry. Yeah. So we have to put our blood glucose into a certain range where our body is accepting food, where our body is craving food. And when our body wants food, it's gonna digest and process it better. And mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you the same example that I've given other people before. Yeah. Um, if I laid out a piece of dry grilled chicken in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. Like like dry, burnt. Yeah, yeah. Are you gonna want to eat it? No, of course not. Okay, you could probably get it down, right? If I, yeah, if so I you're had gonna to. chew it to a paste and swan yeah. chase it with water, right? Yes. Now, if yes. I stick a burger in front of you, what's the first thing your body does? It's gonna crave it. But what is what sign is that? What does your body do? That I'm hungry. No, yeah, but you're gonna smell that burger, and your body does what? I don't know. Tell me. It happens in your mouth. Oh, salivate. Okay. You salivate. What is salivation? It's enzymes. It's the first mode of digestion. So you didn't salivate for the grilled chicken breast yeah. at the same exact time that you did salivate for the burger. Yeah. Okay. So that's your body priming digestion. You're going to, that, that burger is going to digest like air, whereas that chicken's going to sit like a brick for two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's literally your body so, accepting the food. So you're telling me for years and I'm not, and I'm not debating you. I'm just asking you. So you're telling me for years when bodybuilders say it doesn't matter if you're fucking hungry or not, you got to eat. Is that real or not? No, because again, we're in a situation where we have to get those calories down and we have to push our limits. So just because you're not digesting something completely or efficiently doesn't mean that you're not digesting it at all. So we have to weigh those factors, cost versus reward, benefit and whatnot. Mm. But if we can, if, but if we can control it, yeah, of course. say post-workout, yeah. If I know where my blood glucose is and I know where my body's accepting food, then I can usually time that. So what's going to happen is if my blood glucose was say 110 yeah. and I have my post-workout meal, that meal is probably going to take two and a half, three hours to digest. Yeah. Whereas if my blood glucose was at 75, that meal is going to digest in an hour and a half okay. and then I can put more food in. Okay. Okay. So okay. is this, is fiber a big part of your a big part of your diets then because fiber tends to slow everything down and you don't want well, to I use fiber towards the end of the day to push everything through to, so that you go to the bathroom and you're clear for the next day okay. because compounding meals is also a big problem that people yeah. have yeah. whereas you didn't digest the previous meal but it's time for the next meal and then you're just piling them on top so that's then true. that's that that's one thing that fucks up sensitivity in people because yeah. you might have started the day well if you woke up your blood glucose is 85 you ate a meal before the next meal it's 92 before the next meal it's 99 before the next meal it's 104 before the next meal it's 120 so your blood your, the meals are slowly compounding on top of each yeah. other yeah. and uh, i hope they don't mind me mentioning this um i worked with james hollingshead years ago before yeah. he was with patrick tour i don't think um, 
Yeah, no, we did a good job. Listen, yeah. he, he wasn't placing in shows. We hooked up. He never missed the first call out in four shows. Yeah. And yeah. he placed third twice, so he did pretty good. Yeah. But the first show, the second show we did was Spain in 2018. And that was six weeks from off season because he was monitoring his blood glucose for every meal and not compounding them. And he was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger. And he was so fucking lean that we placed six, we placed third in Spain six weeks off his off season. Okay. So now this opens up a whole other can of worms. You know, you're going to, you're going to be on this podcast for like eight hours. You know that, right? So, okay. I have a problem. Every, I think everybody has a problem with compounding meals, right? Everybody, yeah. like everybody is like good when they wake up and they're, and, you know, around meal four, they're like, ah, oh, fuck, I don't feel like eating. And usually they have a shake and whatever. What is your recipe for not ha like dealing with the compounding meals issue? Again, back to the first question you asked me is precision. A lot of times everybody has big meals all day long. All my meals are not big. Yeah. Some of them are small. Yeah. I, and, and, and now you got to remember if you're packing in calories, say you're packing in 8,000 calories, yeah. that doesn't mean you're digesting and processing 8,000. It's not you. It's not, you are what you eat. It's all, you are what you process and absorb. I think that's why I always ate more than normal though, because I realized that whatever I ate, I'm only going to get like somebody would say to me, and I know this now is probably a little bit overkill, but I used to eat like 10 to 12 ounce portions of meat. And they're like, that's way too much protein. And I'm like, I know, but. I want to make sure my tank is topped up and then whatever's left over is obviously going to go to waste, but I don't want to do, I don't want to under, I don't want to underdo it. You know what I mean? Well, I so, think first of all, I'm going to disagree with that. When you say people say that's too much meat, yeah. because I don't think that that's too much meat because a lot of my biggest guys eat 10 ounce meal portions per meal and Dante Trudel, I'm sure you're familiar with yeah, yeah. actually proved this back in the day yeah. when he was having people eat four five, 600 grams of protein in a day, yeah. they were jumping over weight classes. Now I don't mean yeah. going middleweight to light heavy. I mean, middleweight going to heavy. I mean, light heavy going to super in yeah. one year. Yeah. He was yeah. jumping people over weight classes. You watched this happen. Yeah, I did watch it happen. And this, see, this goes back to another point, which is, See, the reason I say the reason I say now it's too much is it might have been hard on my body. I'm not sure. There's probably other factors that that played a part. But um there's so many coaches out there now that are like, you can do it with six ounces. You don't of need course to. you can. It's easier, but it doesn't necessarily mean it works better. Because what happens if you eat too much protein? It converts to glucose and you have some carbs. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. You know, your body's not going to waste the extra protein. So if you eat too many carbs, you get fat. If you eat too much protein, you don't get fat. Well, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Unless you're eating fatty proteins. Yeah. So, okay. So we, we kind of veered off topic there. So how do we, so you basically, what you're saying is outside of your pre and post workout meals, the meals are smaller. So people aren't getting the compounding effect. Well, also back to what I said before, remember my off days are protein veggie. Mm. So you're very empty. I'm giving your digestive trap that people, people have a big, big, um, uh, what, what am I going to say? They neglect or um, don't give the GI enough respect for what it does. True. Your GI is everything. Yeah. Your, without your GI, you're not a bodybuilder. Yeah. And we beat it up. We beat it up. We beat it up. We never clean it up. We never take, we never take care of it. Yeah. You know, I can't tell you, I posted to take uh, 10 to 15 grams of glutamine in an empty stomach. As soon as you wake up about a couple months ago, and I swear to God, I've gotten hundreds of DMS. Oh my God, this fixed my digestion. I'm feeling, yeah of course yeah you yeah, know yeah because glutamine helps repair the intestinal tract yep yep and people don't do that so they're you're, you're beating up your gi tract everything is congested everything it's like a traffic jam in there yeah. so those off days and if i feel like somebody's too clogged up i'll say take two three off days not because they need the rest but because i want to give their gi a break when you say off days you mean off days from a lot of food well when i when i say off day my off days mean no gym Oh, okay. Okay. And so, you know, but also no gym means you're on the lower calorie diet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I clear it out, but there's always smaller meals, even in the, even in the training days. That's right. Okay. That way everything is not running into each other. See, the problem is somebody may be eating 8,000 calories, but it's so congested in there and absorption is so fucked up and intestinal tract is so inflamed. You're getting three, 4,000. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I could cut you down to 6,000 be more efficient with it and you're going to get more out of it. Okay. So let me ask you this. So if I have a six, let's say I have a 5,000 calorie diet, right? And it's six meals a day. So what is that? Uh, 
I'm doing the math wrong here. With six, six times 500. No. What the fuck am I thinking about right now? You're trying to think about how many calories per meal? <laughs> I just went completely, I just went completely fucking brain dead. So, okay. So let's say there you're doing uh, 800 calorie meals, right? Six times eight, you're doing 4,800 calories per, per, uh, per day. Now, if you're doing, you're not going to do 800 every meal though. So what yeah. you're saying is, what you're saying is like your pre and post might be, you know, 1500 and you're going to subtract that from the other meals. Yeah. That's okay. why I said, when I write a diet, I don't have a daily total that I'm looking for. I say, what the does meals. this person need right now? Yeah. 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 So you're still going to get in, excuse me. I thought I was going to sneeze. Um, <laughs> you're still going to get in the 5,000 calories. You're just going to get it in. You're just going to get it in in a more efficient way than me. Absolutely, hundred percent. Because when I when I set up my diet, I'm like, these are my meals, and they're they're pretty. All of them are pretty even, right? There might be a bump a little bit pre post or post, but not dramatically. It seems like yours more dramatic, where you have much smaller meals on the ends. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Um, you've also got to consider the composition of the meals. If I gave you say white fish versus grilled chicken versus uh, London Steak. broil. Yeah, yeah. They're going to digest at different speeds. Exactly. Even though it could be very, very similar macronutrients. Yep. You know, that's why I go with the cream of rice and yogurt pre-workout because it digests like air. Whereas if you match those exact macros with chicken and rice, you're going to take longer to digest. Yeah. I digest script chicken and rice pretty fast. I don't know. Well, you're, well, again, you're acclimated to it. I've never tried the chicken. I've never tried the Greek yogurt with cream or rice. It digests like air. You don't even know you ate. Do you ever get guys that go have a hypo feeling from eating like just cream or rice, like something like a meal with no fats in it? Uh, yeah, I do have guys that do that. In which case I add some fats to it, slow yeah. it down or increase, or increase the content or I change the order in which they eat. This is also a Dante thing. Eat your protein first. Is that, is that really a thing? That's a Dante thing. Eat your protein first because it slows the transit. Really? Okay. So, but even if I have a chicken and rice meal, let's say I'm doing like 300 grams of rice and like six ounces of chicken. If I don't add any avocado or, you know, any olive oil or anything to it, I, I will feel like I'm going hypo an hour later. Well, here's the thing. You also have to consider digestive efficiency and what your body is used to. This is why you don't add different foods at the end of a prep to peak. I can't stand when a client, when a, when a, when a competitor or a coach has somebody dieting on, well, I'm just saying, 10 foods all the way up to the show, and then they throw in odd foods in the final week. Well, their body has no idea to, to, how to digest it because it's not acclimated to that food. The more yeah. frequently you eat a certain food, your body becomes familiarized with it. How? You know, so your body has the same enzymatic release, the same response. It knows what to do with it. So you're, you've probably eaten chicken and rice so much, your body knows what to do. Is that – that's not pro science, is it? Uh, it's more so theory, but it, <laughs> it, it applies, if you, it applies if, you, if you play with it. So your, actually, body, so your body can get acclimated to a food. Is that what you're telling me? It becomes familiar with it. Listen, yeah. if you haven't eaten a burger in 10 weeks and you eat a burger, tell me what happens. You, yeah, you feel a difference. Yeah, yeah, so I that, agree. There's proof right there. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So how small, how small are the other meals? And is like, are you the kind of guy who does like the last meal of the day is no carbs and all that? Like are you, it depends if they're training early morning or not. If they train early morning, then I'm considering their body type. If they're a fast metabolism and they're training early morning, one of your biggest meals might be your last meal. Mm, that's true. That's true. Whereas if I feel like you're the type that accrues body fat, yeah, I'm going to go no carb. When you're coaching a client and their weight is not moving, their strength is not going up, but they're looking better. Do you make change? Do you ever feel like you have to make changes to keep them happy or you just tell them, no, just keep going. I don't give a fuck if people are happy. I don't give a shit. And I tell people, <laughs> I clients, literally, this is verbatim my response. Not, this is not an exaggeration. This is not a joke. You can ask my people. I have a, you, you actually have some of my very, very good athletes. You have Ben, you have yeah. Justin Mackey, the phenomenal our team, yeah. athletes. Yep. And you can ask them. If they say something, if I give them a cheat and they're like, oh, thank you. I'm like, do you honestly think I give a fuck about your satiety? Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't give a shit. This is not for you. This is not for your well-being. I don't yeah. give a shit how you feel. This yeah. is for an effect. Okay. Yeah, true. So do you find the tough love, the tough love goes a lot further than the baby? If you think back to when you competed in sports when you were younger, 
the coach that you hated the most that was always on your ass is probably the one that made you the best. That's true. I feel like you have to have a certain position of authority over clients. I think that like my clients will tell you, they're almost afraid to send me videos and pictures because they're afraid of what I'm going to say, but that's accountability. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that accountability, then, you know, then they're going to do what they want because they don't really care what you say, you know, yeah. and I'll even scold people because I, I review a lot of my clients' videos and make sure they're training properly. So I'll, almost all my clients send me training videos. Yeah. And if it's bad, I'll even say something to them. I'll be like, did you actually watch that back before you sent it to me and thought that I would approve? Yeah. But yeah. If you put it down two reps short of failure. Like, what is that? Like, you didn't even try. Go do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Do like, you I'm, feel I'm, I'm mean about it, but you know what? Like I even posted in my story the other day because one of my clients said to me, he goes, you know, you can be a real asshole sometimes. I said, yeah, but I'll get you where you're going to, you need to go. Yeah. I've been that. I mean, I've been that way too, but what I found over the course of my time coaching and just being around people is some people respond to different stimulus, right? So do you have clients that you have to not hold hands, but like maybe push in a different way? Well, I always try to address the client differently. However, when people sign up with me, I always warn them. I say, listen, I'm harsh. I'm tough. I'm mean. I don't give many compliments. I might not be for you if you're sensitive. That's why I don't work with women. Um, yeah. I had a conversation the other day with a friend about a woman who's a head case. And I said, she probably would have uh, hung herself if she was with me. Because mm. I'd have just straight, I'd have fucking, I'd have just said, like, what, she cheated? I wouldn't fucking say, oh, well, maybe you cheated. And I know you cheated. You're all fucking playing. That's why you're not getting anywhere. Blame yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm mean. I'm mean. Yeah. I don't pull punches. I, don't I, I mean, orders. there's something to be said for that. I mean, I always, that always kind of got me. It kind of got me to where I was going. Like I needed somebody to shit on me to fucking work harder. I don't, I'm not, the pat on the back doesn't do it for me. How many times have you heard a client say, Oh, I'm flat. I'm flat. And then they tell you again the next day. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm doing good, but I'm flat. And then the next day, Oh, I'm doing good, but I'm flat. And I'll just straight reply back to them. You're not getting more food. Stop asking. Oh, I wasn't asking that. Then why are you <laughs> continually telling me you're flat? I can see. They're I'm hinting the coach. at you. Yeah, I'm yeah. good at this. I know what I see. I know you're flat. You don't got to tell me you're not getting more food. Stop asking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where do you, where do you see this going? Like, are you, do you enjoy what you're doing or do you have other plans for other things or like how big do you want your roster to get? Do you want to coach more top pros? Like what is your, what is, where are you I want to coach more top pros, but I want to build them. Oh, so you want to start I don't from the like, beginning. Like I said before, I don't like taking on seasoned pros usually because they have an ego. And a pro like you said, they have a process that they're used to. And it's very hard to break that. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, it's I'm the bodybuilder. I got here. I did yeah. this. Well, yeah, you got as far as genetics and effort are going to take you. Now you need knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so, not, but you have to, I just want to say something for those bodybuilders that are like that because I can be like that. It's not always that I know more. It's like we said in the beginning, I think sometimes it's just, I'm comfortable. Well, here's I'm the thing. comfortable with this. So I know this is familiar to me and that's why, right? It's not. Well, again, back to, back to one of your buddies, James Hollingshead. Yeah. Anytime he didn't like something that I implemented or felt something or had a, had a comment about it, it wasn't, I'm not doing it. We talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. He threw it right at me. Well, yeah. I found that this works and I've done this point. And then we can say, okay, so we did it together. Mm -hmm. Say mm -hmm. something. Don't just not do it and let me think that you're doing it. Yeah, and, exactly. and then I'm analyzing all the wrong, uh, all the, all the wrong things coming back and yeah. all the wrong feedback. And then I think the wrong thing. So I'm making wrong choices. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to uh, turn the conversation a little bit towards more macro focused things because are more macronutrient because I feel like, not enough people know about fats and where they should add their fats, where they should not add their fats or what type of fats, because everybody's talking about carbs. Everybody. I lowered my carbs. I increased my carbs, blah, blah, blah. I like that better. Yeah. Well, so do I. And I, and I feel like there's a lot you can do with increasing and dropping fats. And I wanted to kind of get into it with you. So where do you implement fats in your diet and how much is somebody using typically uh, in like an off season plan, let's say a 200 pound bodybuilder, like what's the percentage they're getting now in? early day, early day. I'm not going to go high in fats simply because that's slow motility. That's right. So they're going to slow the transit in which everything goes to your system. And like we yeah. talked about, you're going to have wheels crashing into each other compound. Right. right. So we don't want that. So right. early in my day is very, very low fat. However, after the workout, and I believe Dave Palumbo is the one that made this one popular, is he said that there's essential amino acids, there's essential fatty acids, there's no such thing as essential carbohydrate. True. Carbohydrates are fuel and fuel only. Yeah. 
So you need them around the workout. You need them early in the day. You don't need them late after. Okay. So you, yes, you want to replenish glycogen, but it doesn't have to be done in one meal post workout. It's done over time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, actually Scott Stevenson sent me research that actually uh, supported um, actually he completely gave me this theory. It wasn't even my theory that a damaged muscle doesn't necessarily uptake glucose efficiently. Okay. That's why it's important to, to go into a show recovered or you won't load properly. So you can load. The yeah. muscles are yeah. damaged. They don't uptake glucose as well. So what's the point in smashing carbs post workout for like meal and meal and meal when your body's not even uptaking it efficiently, stick yeah. to the protein, stick to the essential fatty acids, um, you know, replenish intramuscular triglycerides. If you're a lean enough type that is, that is burned through them mm. and then go from there. So early day is carbs, late day is fats. Okay. So but if I have a fast metabolism, I will go with more liquid sources of fats, like an, like an extra virgin olive oil, avocado yeah. oil, neck nut oil, things that are going to digest easy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even whole legs. So late in the day, so you're talking about from, from whole food sources as well. So even when early in the day, you're not doing any whole eggs for breakfast. You're not doing like... Well, I do, I do two whole eggs with breakfast simply yeah. for the essential fatty acids, yeah. um, for the vitamin and nutrient content, yeah. you know, but you're not going to see me telling somebody eat five eggs for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saving them for meal for post So we're assuming if a guy trains after meal two or three, you're saving for meals four, five, six. Yeah, and I usually I usually almost always go with steak for the final meal, steak okay. or salmon. I let them I let them choose if they want to swap it out. So when you're talking about fats, are you talking about added fats or fats from food only? Like, do you ever add fats? Like, if you're doing say you're doing a meal with steak or salmon, would you add an avocado? Would you add an olive yeah, oil? Yeah, I, I listen. I love I love I love avocado. I yeah. like guacamole. I like extra virgin olive oil. I like mac nut oil. I love avocado oil. Um, I'll throw in extra whole eggs, which is a fat source from food. Yeah. Um, but generally, yeah, I do like adding, I do like adding fat sources. Okay. And what, what amount are we talking about, uh, per meal? Like, are you doing more than 15 grams in a meal? Are you doing like, are you it depends on, again, that's going to depend on the person. If I feel, if they digest it, how big they are, how fast their metabolism is, you yeah. know, I'm not going to put 25, 30 grams of fat in a meal that somebody's like an endo, you know, they're just yeah. going to get fat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas I will do something like that. I have, I have guys with very fast metabolisms where I have them eating a 10 ounce ribeye and three whole eggs for, for dinner. Yeah. That's probably 70 grams of fat. Yeah. 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 Okay. I got you. I got you. It's all dependent. Um, you seem very online. Uh, I feel like you, I don't want to say rub people the wrong way, but you seem very, like you have your opinions and people don't necessarily always take them right. Why, what, what's, why is that? Uh, well, one, I'm, I'm, I'm not really filtered. So I, I don't always, <laughs> I, I can I tell, I, I can tell from the beginning of our conversation. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what? I don't do it on purpose. It's just my personality. Um, the friends that I've hung out with the way I've grown up and the way I've cultivated my personality, I just don't really handle things with click hit gloves real quick. So real well. So I could probably say things a little bit too blunt. Yeah. You know, like if I have something to say, I don't think about how to say it softly. I just say it. Yeah, and yeah. one of my favorite quotes is nobody is hated as much. Nobody is so hated as he who tells the truth. True. So, yeah. and I forget who said it. Somebody said it recently. They're like, the problem with the world right now is, is uh, everybody who lies is respected. And everybody who tells the truth is hated because people don't like to hear the truth. That's true. You know, if people, if somebody comes up to me and like, they say to me like, oh, do you know, do you think I have. A lot of people will DM me because I've made a lot of these posts. Like, do I have the genetics for classic? And I'll straight up, but no, you don't. You'd be a, but you need to be a bodybuilder yeah. um, because you could create the appearance of shape by making the muscle bigger. Yeah. But then yeah. you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be in the you weight be class. class. Yeah. 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 So if, if you don't, I think if you don't have small hips and you don't have a small waist, like classic is not an, I'm not big enough for bodybuilding division. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And I that's how people you. treat it. Like, yeah. oh, I just want to be classic. I don't want to get too big, but you're not classic and you're not going to do well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, a specific shape that you have to have. So what is it? Do you think there are people in the bodybuilding community that shouldn't be in the bodybuilding community that are like making it look bad? Are you, are you kind of against There's a these lot people? of those guys? I actually yeah. caught flack. I actually caught flack uh, about, I think it was about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. Um, 
and this is dead honest. What a lot of people are gonna, what a lot of people that know me know about me is I, I, I don't, I don't lie often. I really don't lie. I tell the truth, and that's why I'm one of the reasons why people don't like me. And I made this story in my in my story on Instagram, basically saying who are the worst coaches and why. Now oh, no. my plan was to laugh with my friends. Yeah, because it's like a running inside joke. But okay. I got like a hundred DMs asking for the results, so I'm like, oh shit, this is gonna cause a shitstorm. You didn't so, put up results, did you? No, I didn't. Okay. Because I, I didn't initially plan to. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, this is gonna cause a shitstorm. But so many people were asking, so I made a post in a group and I said, you know, what do you think the upside and downside of this? And somebody attacked me, like, oh, he said, oh, you knew who they were gonna say, and that's why you posted it. And my, my answer is, well, if if you think that I know who I'm gonna, who uh, who they were gonna say, then you're probably thinking the same names. Isn't that what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, if they're yeah, yeah. If it's on, if it's on, if it, if, if you think that I know who they're gonna say, and it's on your mind too, then you're thinking it. Why? Yeah, yeah. But you I know? don't think. But maybe they're thinking. Well, we're all thinking it, but you're the one who said it. But I didn't imply anybody. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even give so much as a hint of who to who to who to. I just. I, it was. It was a completely blank, transparent post. Who do you think? I didn't say this method, that guy. I hate this. I hate that. No, I just said who. Do you like to stir the pot or no? If I, I see the thing is, um, I have a thing against bad coaches because I feel like it's deceitful to the rest of the community. Um, a lot of these kids are new. You know, how do they know? If I lined up 10 physicists for you right now, could you tell me who sucks and who's good? No, no. Exactly, because you don't know physics. Yeah. So yeah. how the fuck are these people going to pick out coaches when every one of their Instagrams is a highlight reel? Yeah, yeah. You know, they don't know. There's no, there's no, there's no button that says here, click here and get a review or all the bad, like, like talk to this guy. He had a bad experience. You don't know you're new, you yeah. know? And a lot of these guys, I think that a lot of coaches um, are very good salesmen. I think a lot of them get in over their heads. They, they take jobs before they're ready for it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I made, I made an example. I was joking around with somebody just before this podcast. And I said, look, if, uh, if you, put on your resume that you're a uh, computer programmer and they, they hire you and give you computer programming and you can't do it. You're going to get fired. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I think a lot of people take on pros and high level athletes before they're knowledgeable and ready to do it. And then they screw it up and they fail because they weren't ready for it. So well, why not? But isn't that kind of like a, isn't that capitalism at its best? I mean, let the people do what they want to do. Fuck it. No, I listen, I understand that. But on the same note, it depends on your intent. I'm big on intent. If you think you can do it, and you try, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you, but if you know that there's a lot of people that know more than you and you don't, and you know, you're still trying to work with people that you know that you're still trying to figure it out, you know, if you're trying to figure it out, you shouldn't be charging them. You know, mm. you're using them as a guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. You know, Where if you, whereas if you know you can do the job, that's fine. But what if somebody so thinks, think but wait a minute, what if somebody thinks they know how to do it, but their system is different than yours? Well, I mean, if, if they have great results, then it's fine. There's more than one path to the same destination. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. there's a lot. Listen, I have I, I have a few friends. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Andrew Wu and uh, Johnny Casalina, and we all coach differently, and we all get great results. So, what is your what is your main problem then? Is it is it just the complete bullshit? Like, what yeah, is your? Yeah, it's the bullshit that pisses me off when people say something that's blatantly incorrect. Or it's, or it's very obvious that they don't understand. Yeah. My mind goes, there's no way they don't know that they're not wrong, or there's no way that they know that they don't know that they're not sure. So I have a problem with that. I have a problem with bad information. I have a problem with people teaching people incorrectly. And one of my biggest problems is the coaches who get a hold of good pros and that's all they post, and then they shit on their amateurs. Mm. They, use, they use two or three guys to market. Yeah. They lure in a hundred unsuspecting people, pretty yeah. much ignore them, cycle through it, get new ones. Then they're constantly cycling through people. Their turnovers like retarded because they don't actually deliver to the low level, level people. They're using their pros as bait. But I think like, that's what I meant about, uh, about capitalism at its best though. I think eventually those people get figured out. Uh, and people... Yes. And, 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 and I try to speed that process up. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're never going to find a field that doesn't hate people that make their field look bad. Bad, good yeah. doctors hate bad doctors. And they'll yeah. tell you. I yeah. know plenty of doctors. And they'll be like, I can't stand bad doctors. Yeah, yeah. You know? And you're going to find people in construction. They're like, that company sucks. They fuck everything up. 
No, you're like, right. Anybody who takes their profession seriously hates people that make that profession look bad. But I think our I think our profession is different in that we have platforms that we can go on and actually tell people about the other people. Well, that depends. See, the platform like yours right here, we have an open mic. Mm -hmm. I can't go right on that person's page. They're going to delete the comment and block me. No, I know, but is it bad? Yeah, I don't know. I'm torn on this topic. I really am because there's back in the day, I was very adamant about talking about certain people that I thought were really bad for the industry. And I'm, I'm not going to go over who they are. They're, they're in early podcasts, but I, I, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, this person's not good for the industry. They're not doing anything of any sort to help anyone. Yeah. And that was actually why I started the podcast. I'm like, I want to help people. But then I realized I'm, I'm taking money away from people by talking bad about them. And then that made me feel bad for talking bad about them. Yeah. But you know what? Taking money again, away from somebody who's not doing a good job or is a scam artist is not a bad thing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So listen, yeah. well, I, I even said, uh, when everybody gave me shit, I said, I wish Boston Lloyd would do that survey and post it. I said, because I'm completely open to anybody and everybody who's worked with me posting their reviews. Yeah. yeah. If somebody's got something bad to say about me, go ahead, bring it to light. I don't yeah. care. Yeah, you know, because yeah. people need to know the truth. What you'll probably hear a lot of is Phil's a fucking asshole. You know, he never compliments anyone. You know, he's very demanding. You'll probably hear a lot of shit I, like I, that. I, we're, so we sound a lot alike. <laughs> but but the, the point is, listen, I should be reviewed. You should be reviewed. Everybody should be reviewed. And that should be okay. What is Yelp? Yelp is business review. So it's okay to do there, but it's not okay to do for us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This yeah. is how people figure things out. Listen, when you want to deal with, when you want to have your kitchen remodeled, yeah. do you just pick out the first fucking person or do you go around and look for reviews and their work and, and figure it out? But I think it's different if there was a, this is why I think people might get bent about it. I think it's different if a whole bunch of people that were coached by that person put up a review versus another coach talking about that person. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When I put up that post on my story, I'm not going to name names. And if people DM me, I'm going to block you. So don't even ask me. Um, <laughs> I really will. Um, there was two names that were repetitive through the whole thing. Really? The whole thing. And you know what? These people, that if you go to their Instagram, they have 700 followers, 800, 1,000. And if they were to speak up, these big name coaches and their followings attack the shit out of you. Yeah. And they're scared. They're scared to speak up. So they want somebody like me to speak up. I won't. I don't want to do it anymore because I don't want to get uh, involved. I, I, I see. suggested Boston do it because he will. I see what you're saying. So, so you're using you're using Boston to do your dirty work. <laughs> well, no, because listen, he's like, hey, review me too. Take shots at me. Do it. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, I'm I'm willing to put my name in the hat because I'm sure of what I do. Yeah. Other coaches don't want that to happen because they know what's going to pop up. Yeah. What do you think that, what do you think is the number one way a coach will scam a client? Exactly it, what is, I told you. Is it they, just they, that, is it just that they don't have your level of knowledge or are they doing something else that people should be looking out for? I don't, you know what? I can't say my level of knowledge. I have a different kind of knowledge. Everybody specializes in different areas. You know, my goal was always to be, you know, quote unquote, you know, the Mr. Olympia of coaches who is the biggest, best combination of all areas, training, nutrition, drugs, you know, everything. That yeah. was my goal. But I'm never going to be the best at one. You yeah. know, if you look at, say, like Kasim, who's amazing at training. I don't have his training knowledge. Who's, who's Kasim? Why do I not? one training? I've never heard. I'm sorry. I've never heard of him. He's very, he's, listen, he's, he's, he's one of my favorites to follow. He's incredibly smart. Okay. And, we might disagree on some philosophies with training, but if you get down to functional anatomy, I don't know my anatomy like him, Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So there's always going to be people that are better than you in a specific realm. I just wanted to be the best combination of all of them. So yeah. I can never say that I'm smarter than everyone or I'm better than, I'm different than everyone. You're, de you're definitely what? I'm different. They're different than everyone. Okay. You know? So I don't, I don't think that. I don't but I'm trying, people... but I'm trying to, I'm trying to give somebody some ammunition or not ammunition, but a little bit of a heads up, like, I'm a new kid. I'm looking for a coach. What's some red flags you can point to that are like, that's probably not the guy you should go to. Jumping to high doses right away, not being able to explain things, no rhyme or reason to the structure of 
either the PEDs or the food. I tell my clients, like, not jokingly, in a very serious manner, I was like, if you want to test me, go ahead and try to test me on the stupidest fucking thing you could find on the fucking program. Why 50 grams of carbs in, in meal two instead of 60? I'll give you a reason. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing that yeah. I write down that I can't explain. Yeah. So yeah. When, you, when a coach says, because I said so, or just trust me, that means they don't know or it was random. Or they copied okay, wait pieces. a minute. I have a, I have a, you have a call? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I have, sorry. I have a question about that. I got into it with a client a long time ago because when I started, I used to be the guy who was like, don't ask me, just do what I tell you. And it wasn't because I couldn't answer it. It was because I feel like you're paying me to be coached. You're not paying me to be taught. So like, I'm not a teacher. You're not, you're not paying for like a university course where you pay me and then I explain every little thing and teach you about nutrition. You're paying for me to tell you, this is a diet, you go do it. And this is the result that's going to happen at the end of the, well, here's, here's right? the thing. First of all, you're a better businessman than I am. You're busy as shit. You probably, you probably literally like block out every 15 minutes of your day. So, <laughs> you know, your time is tight. You don't want to take time explaining. This is what I do primarily no, that's for a living. But that's not fair because no, no, I, I would never use that excuse because if you don't have the time, then you shouldn't be doing it. No, but I mean, that's yeah. probably why you couldn't waste the time. You couldn't spare the time. You no, know, no. If you, if you had to explain everything to all 50 of your clients, you're spending, it's like, that's like 10 hours out of your day. But it's more, but I'm more asking you on a philosophical, the philosoph philosophical end of it. Are you teaching or are you coaching? Because if you're coaching. Well, here's, here's, what I, here, here's what I get asked. Yeah. Uh, people still remember back in 2017, I had an apprenticeship program and I produced two coaches, Kyle Wilkes and Nelson Jones. Okay. Um, Kyle Wilkes has been seen training Chris Bumstead. He's been seen training Mike Toscano. He's been seen training Nick Walker. He's very highly regarded. Okay, I've heard Nelson the name. Jones, Nelson yeah. Jones has turned a ton of girls pro. He's got a bunch of Olympians. So I produced some pretty fucking damn good coaches out of yeah. people that weren't even regional bodybuilders. Okay. But, okay. but I identified their intelligence. And we did that. So now everybody comes to me. Can you teach me? Can you teach but me? Wait a minute. But time out. You specifically said that was an apprenticeship and you were teaching them. Exactly. So right. here's my thing. I was going to get to that. Sorry. So now I get a lot of people that if I sign up with you, will you teach me? And I, my answer is I will answer questions about your program. Yeah. I am not answering questions about anything else. I see. If you want to know why we are doing what you're doing, I'm fine with that. If you're going to ask me about this and that topic, no. Okay. So let me ask you this then just in general, and we're told we're totally away from t like the topic for people listening. I just, but I'm just curious myself. So uh, aside, apart from you, just in general, do you think coaches should be teaching or coaching? Because I think teaching is a totally different thing. I don't think that, I think they should be coaching, but I think they should be able to explain what they're doing. If somebody wants to know why or isn't sure of something. But you know, you get that client who's like, well, what about this? And what about that? And I make it very clear to them. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here 10 hours a day explaining everything to you. So there is a point where you're like, look, man, there is a point. Yeah. yeah listen, yeah. I listen, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to explain the shit down to the fucking molecular level. I probably can't. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you know, I will within reason explain things. So you're saying you a know? question here and there. And I agree with that. I think if there's within reason, I'm like, yes, I will explain what I'm doing. If to you're you, asking but... me things that you can Google, don't. Don't ask me how many grams of protein is in the fucking meal. Okay. Don't ask me how many calories are on your program. Okay. Do the math and Google it. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, you know? now I think we're 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 on the same page. Then. Okay. But if it's advanced, like they send me a video. Like there was a coach the other, there was a, somebody that posted the other day that leverage squats are useless, and I completely disagree. I think that they used them properly. What are I think what, it, maybe I'm not in the loop. What are leverage squats? Like a V squat. Like a machine. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Something why, on a hinge. Why are they useless? Well, he's saying that they're useless because people, quote unquote, leverage them. And the way people leverage them is they drive their ass and their back into the back pad. And sure, my yeah. solution to that is yeah. even if you're using a machine, there's going to be pressure in two places, your feet and your shoulders. If you come up to me on a hack squat, you'll always be able to slide your hand under my ass. Mm. But why? Wait, that's not a good idea. I mean, does that mean I've been doing it wrong all this time? Because my ass well, is pressed thing. against well, the here, pad. Here's the thing. If you drive your ass into the ass pad, into the back pad, you're generating force into your posterior chain. You're making it a lot of glutes. Okay. So next but time I, you get on a hack squat, just try this for me. I yeah. want you against the back pad, but yeah. very lightly so that somebody could slide their fingers under if they wanted to. 
and just press through your feet and your shoulders, you're going to get a completely different quad contraction. Wouldn't it be hard to go heavy like that? No, not when you get, not when you do it right. Maybe if I get used to it, because I feel like I want to be pressed against the back pad and I want my back arched so that well, I can. Well, again, arching your back. Why, why, do, why do people arch their backs on a hack squat? The reason why you arch your back is because it, it, puts, it, it, it generates force and tension and elasticity into your posterior chain. It makes it easier. You're using a lot of glutes. You're using a lot of hamstrings. So by not pressing into that back pad, you're actually removing that elasticity. So yeah, you're going to be weaker, but your quads are going to work harder. Okay. I actually wow. posted an entire tutorial on this on my uh, Instagram. Look at that. Uh, a, like a, two weeks ago. Look at that. At 42, I just learned how to hack squat. Uh, I, could, I could show you, I could show you <laughs> mind-blowing stuff. In this is podcast is amazing. The other, a few weeks ago, we taught, me and Nick Walker taught guys just training how to work out. <laughs> so, so it's like. That guy's uh, a beast. That guy trains his ass off. Who, guy? Yeah. We had to we had to tell him this like this is we had a whole podcast about pretty much him scaling back his workout because he was just doing because way too he much. He trains too fucking hard and he's gonna yeah. get hurt. Yeah. So he did. And I actually told him to go to see John because John's the one who got me to scale back and how much progress I made after I started working with John. And so he did, and now he's making all his progress and he's been like, Holy fuck, man, I didn't realize how I didn't realize I was training wrong, which is it's mind blowing to think that a guy can be thirty eight on the Olympia level and his training is not optimal. Well, here's the thing. Like I said, genetics and effort get you so far. And then at some point you need knowledge. Yeah. Look at Ronnie Coleman. Ronnie Coleman was ninth. Ronnie Coleman was sixth. He linked up with Chad. He never lost again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, except once yeah. to Gunther. But, yeah, that doesn't count. But my point is, Ronnie was Ronnie, was ninth, was sixth. And then when you threw knowledge into the equation, Ronnie was untouchable. Yeah, yeah. You so know? I want to touch on one more topic before you go. Uh, because it's, I think it's really important. Uh, I want to talk about gear and how much gear and why everybody's doing so much, but I want to be real about it. They're like, I don't want, you know, I want to, you know, some people think that we come on here and we're trying to play it safe. Cause a lot of guys will say like, Oh, don't do that much and do this or that. Well, a lot of guys lie. That's the thing. I try to be pretty honest about my dosages. Like my average dose for the last five years of tests has been like 1250 is my sweet spot. Like that's what I found is good. So Basically, I want to get into some gear talk and figure out where people should be on the level and where's too much and where's too little. Well, that's one of the main things that I see a lot of bad coaches fucking up is they really rely on gear yeah. because the biggest thing that's abused right now is T3 because of improper nutrition. Yeah. So what, what is T3? T3 is synthetic thyroid. So what happens is people are dieting somebody for a show. Mm -hmm. They're over dieting. And what happens when you over diet? Your metabolism slows down. So instead of knowing how to pick the metabolism up with food, they just throw T3 in. Yeah. And then metabolism slows down again and they throw T3 in. So if you see a coach, and I'm going to say this across the fucking board, if you see a coach throwing 100 plus micrograms of T3 no. at you, they don't know what they're doing with nutrition. Agreed. Agreed. My, my, a high end of T3 for me is 50. For the and that's, pro that's probably the very end. Yeah. Like my, my last prep, I was at 25 the whole way through. Yeah. Not the whole prep, but like when I started it to when I was done the prep. I never went over 25. Because you know what you're doing with food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't... A good coach can use food to keep that metabolic rate going. Yeah. So, okay, so that's a, a good thing on T3. What about some of these kids that come to me are doing, like, crazy amounts of tests? Where, where, what's the truth on tests? Are people taking, like, you know, Nasser was like, you got to take four grams a day and shit. Like, what's the truth? People are compensating for lack of effort. They're not hard workers. Okay. And they don't know what it's like to really push in the gym. And you know what? I don't blame a lot of them. Because they've never been shown, True. you know, I think, and you could probably even remember back to like specific workouts in your youth where somebody put you through a workout and you're like, all right, this is how I've got to train. I like, remember I, I wasn't doing this. Yeah. I remember the exact guy and I remember the, the day. Yeah. Remember, yeah. But yeah. a lot of people haven't been shown that they think because they're failing and because they're sweating that they're working out hard. They don't realize if I put a gun to your mother's head, you'd get five reps. Yeah. 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 You know? So they're not yeah. training like, like do or die. The thing I think people don't understand is not just, I always feel like it's really hard to explain it. You have to be there with somebody. You have because, to experience it, yes. Yeah, because it's not just somebody that's watching will be like, oh, okay, well, I'll do five more reps next time. But it's not just the reps. It's almost like how you do the reps, you know, the rep speed, the cadence, the, like the whole thing, right? Sometimes it gets harder. They do shorter reps. They rest. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. bounce. You know, their yeah. form breaks down when it gets hard. The yeah. hardest thing to do when you start hitting failure is hold your form. True. 
And yeah. a lot of people don't do that. So yes, like you said, you need that person in your face, in your ear, demonstrating it in front of you, or you're not really going to get it. You're not going to yeah. get that message. So unless you had that person hands on, it's not really your fault. Now, yeah. if after the fact you don't do it, now it's your fault. Yeah. Yeah. But I do agree with you that it's good that people send training videos. I try and tell my guys that are, uh, that I coach that like, if you're on Instagram and you put a video up, tag me in it so I can see what you're doing. Yeah. Um, okay. So you think that people are doing more drugs because they're not training hard. Do, is that just us sounding like old motherfuckers or is that the truth? No, no, no. Listen, I'm telling you straight up from experience, 20 years experience in this field. People don't train hard enough. They're not consistent on their diet. They want to take the easy way out. That's why everybody's so interested in drugs because this is the only sport in the world where people can't accept genetics. We can accept somebody's eight foot fucking tall. We can accept somebody smarter than us, but we can't accept that somebody grows better than us. You That's know, true, yeah. so if you're yeah. bigger than me, you must take more. What drug are you taking that I'm not taking? The big thing now is Incrolix, which I think is garbage. Do you? you know? I, I, think it, I think it is because, again, you have a sequence that you have to go through with GH in order for proliferation to happen, which is cell division, and then differentiation, which is those cells becoming specified mature cells. So okay. there's a process that your body has to go through when you take GH, and that's why it works so well, whereas Incrolex is straight IGF-1. Yeah. Um, I think that it gets more side effects than it does gains, and I think you better, you're better off spending money on more GH. But, but again, everybody thinks now that, oh, Incrolex is why everybody in Kuwait is so much bigger than it. No, it's not. It's no, don't they don't that. fucking miss meals. They don't miss workouts. They don't put the weight down earlier. They send your ass home. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I've, I've had enough people on the podcast now and I've had Brandon on a couple of times and the story is the same from everybody. They eat, sleep, breathe fucking like if you're not in your room eating, you're at the gym. Otherwise you're in your room eating. Like there's home. no, yeah, there's no. And I think if, if people didn't experiment, if they did that for one week in their own house, they would see how much progress they'd make in that one week where they just eat train all day. That's why when I get my, when I get my check-in forms with my clients, a lot of times I'll look at the compliance and they'll be like, all right, well, are we going to make any changes? And I'll be like, well, you're at 80% compliance. When you're at a hundred, then we'll consider it. Wait a minute. Because you still me, have 20, <laughs> you have 20% room for improvement. I love this. So what is the, <laughs> okay. We do the same thing, but you, you call it something different. I'm going to steal that from you. So you have a compliance chart. Like no, I, I, I basically, I, I have, I have, uh, actually, I was actually talking to Dorian Hamilton last night. He has a compliance chart. Okay. I don't have a compliance chart, but I have fields. How are your pumps? How are your strength? How, one to 10? How, how on do your meals? That's work, how I how do much it. Yeah. Sleep. And then I gauge it like that. And That's if how they I do want, it. And if they're like, oh, well, you know, we're not doing this. We're not doing that. How do we increase? I'm like, well, you can get better here, 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 and here before we change anything. Yeah. 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 I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to steal Dorian's compliance chart because I have to ask those questions every week on a scale of one to 10. How was your, well, he actually calculates it out. So he's like, you're at 70% compliance. (laughs) You're, you're, you're doing two thirds of what you're supposed to What you know, like there's 30% right there. Yeah. Yeah. And and for those listening, the reason we ask those questions is, there's no point in changing anything in the, in the program if you're not complying with everything yeah, that's exactly. already given to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's your results, 30%. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if let's, t- let's say you got a guy who's working hard, training hard, what's a proper dose of testosterone? Say, let's well, start there. Here's the, here's the thing. And I know it's going to be have, different, but we'll try. People have, muscle, people have muscle growth genetics. Yeah. People have body fat genetics. People have health genetics. There's people that can take everything under the sun and their blood works perfect. There's people that can fucking take five milligrams of D ball and their blood works off. Yeah. So drug tolerance is also a thing. Well, hyper responders. I remember I had Dr. Dean on the podcast. He was talking about hyper responders being a real thing too. So, well, yeah, that would just basically be, I believe like, like how fast you metabolize drugs. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would assume anyway, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't see there it. Was a I, little, there was a little bit more to it, but that's pretty much what he was saying. Yeah how fast you metabolize drugs and yeah. burn through it. Yeah. So a hyper responder yeah. would be somebody who, la- I guess the drug is a little longer lived in the body. I guess I'd, I'd have to go back and watch it, but it was, it was pretty, I mean, he broke it all the it way makes down. Sense. Yeah. It yeah. makes sense. So I think that, yes, you do have hyper responders, but I also think it's how well you tolerate the drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, bodybuilders are the only jerk offs in the world. Now I know you like fast cars, so you're going to love this analogy. Um, would you race me for pink slips if your engine was at 50%? Of course not. Of course not, because your car's not going to go as fast as it can. Yeah, yeah. Bodybuilders are the only morons that think that all our machinery can be at fucking 60% and we're still going to grow our best. <laughs> but that's because we have. Look, 
my machinery and people know this, you know, I have, I have kidney issues now that I've talked about at, ex- at length. Right. And, uh, I'm working on getting healthier and all stuff, but, but how were they when you were young growing? Well, this is the thing is it, this is the thing that people, you know, that, that don't understand about blood work is it's a steady decline. Right. Yeah. So, but my best year of bodybuilding was in 2015, but they had already declined not significantly, but a bit. So, but you had did the hard, hard work and you had built your base. That's true. That's true. So you're All saying people should try to build their base as young as possible while their health is still resilient. So you're saying that base might not have built, been built or not built as easily if I was. Well, here's, here's exactly what happened with you. While you were healthy, you built all your muscle, that, which is the hard part. That's yeah. the hardest part. Yeah. And then as you got older, your skin started thinning. So yeah. then that muscle mass met the period where your skin was thin yeah. and you displayed your physique the best. That was your, that was your peak. That was your prime. Yeah. 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 So you had thin skin, big, thick, hard, dense muscle from years of training. It was just, it was the right time for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be when you were healthiest, but like you said, I think most people don't realize the main reason why bodybuilders career end is because yeah. of health decline and yeah. it's wear and tear, wear yeah. and tear. It's yeah. good. If you think that you're not going to have wear and tear, you're out of your mind. There's yeah. going to be a point where it ends and it's always health. It's not drive. It's not passion that ends their career. True. It's health. True. So the harder you lay on it, the sooner it's off. Yeah, no, that's true. It's in health doesn't necessarily mean kidneys or liver. It could be like Dorian. GI. Dorian could be like he tore a bunch of muscles and he's like, I can't fucking train anymore. It could be that. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it, it, it could be neuro. It could be muscular. It could be connective tissue. It could be your GI tract, which we beat the hell out of. Yeah. Um, my friend, Chris Tuttle actually thinks that all of us cause our own GI problems from constantly hammering it throughout our lives. And we're all going to end up with GI problems. Eventually. I think he's right. My mom, my, you know? mo- my mom who knows nothing about nutrition has said that to me. Yeah. She goes, she goes, you're eating enough food for a person's entire life in 20 years. Yeah. What do you think that's going to do to your intestines? And your mom is a thousand percent yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, wear and tear is, is, is going to get us. So it depends on how much drugs you can tolerate, how that affects your health. One of my biggest things with peaking, for example, oh, his car- coach carved him up too much. His coach used too many days. Coach did this. His coach- how about his kidneys didn't work? Mm, yeah. If, if your kidneys aren't functioning, I don't care how many diets that you take. Yeah, you're not going to look dry, yeah. There was a picture of Kai Green, I believe it was 2014, right before he split with Oscar. And it was the most muscular in the gym in red trunks. And his ankles were blown up, and he was shredded up top. Yeah. He had a he – had, that was kidney failure signs, yeah. buddy. He had a DMA. So, yeah. you know, and, and you can't get dry if your kidney's not functioning. And I had somebody come to me last year, a uh, black guy, great muscle bellies, great physique. Oh, I just can't get lean. I'm five weeks out. So my ass is thinking, wow, this guy's about to make me look good. Yeah. So sends me the bloods, his kidney values are off the charts. So uh, what is your, what, 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 what role does your kidneys play? Lipolysis, fat processing. I mean, your, your liver, I should say, sorry. Yeah. So I said to him, your liver is not functioning enough for you to get peeled. That's why you're not getting peeled. And he's like, oh, okay. So then he went and tried it on his own pulled out of the show two weeks later. But if your liver is severely compromised, you're not getting peeled. Yeah, yeah. It's not happening. And if your kidneys are compromised, you're not getting dry. Yeah. I can't and not be... only that, your, your system is stressed. And then there's a cascade of other things that we can go into without getting off topic again. That, mm. that can just compromise your system. So how heavy you go on the drugs are going to affect all of those processes. Mm-hmm. How do you know how heavy to start somebody? I think that's where I want to go with it. How, how do you know how, let's say a guy comes to you and he says, Phil, I don't care what I have to do. I'll do anything. I usually tell them find another coach if you have that type of attitude. <laughs> because Why? that means Why? that usually that usually means they're gonna they're gonna embellish on the doses I give them. Oh, you think you're gonna boost me? I psychologically profile people too. Okay, I can tell. So, <laughs> so if I don't think that we're a good fit or if I don't trust you, it doesn't matter how good I am, you're gonna screw it up and it's gonna look like I did it. <laughs> so I can't let that reflect on my brand and my reputation. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. care how good you are. If you show up looking like shit, it's on me. That's true. Even if you, I don't care if you ate fucking 10 pizzas before stage. Phil, what did you do? Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not going to be his fault. It's going to be it's your fault. It's not going to be his fault. So yeah. I won't risk it, you know? Okay. Can you give me a dose before we move on? Because I've asked, like, I've asked four times now. So All I'm right, trying, my bad. I, I, I I'm start trying... low dose. I always start low dose. Always. What's, what's low dose? Can you give me a number? Okay. Um, one of my, t- I typically, low dose for me. Yeah. If I give you an advanced competitor, yeah. I'm going to go probably 250 every other day on, on a test, and I'm probably going to run like 150 on an anabolic. 
That's okay. a baseline. Okay. Yeah. I agree with that. You're so talking that's going to come out there. Oh, that's going to come out to about 875 a week test and uh, 525 on the anabolic. Yeah. But you're talking about an advanced competitor, like somebody at the talking, na yeah, I don't national level. Work with beginners. You don't work with any beginners. I do. I do lifestyle. I do work with beginners, but I don't typically. Most people that come to me want to turn pro. Yeah. Yeah. Do you just like training those people more because they're going to listen to you? I, I, I like training everybody because you know what? It's just as rewarding when somebody wants to get ready for their wedding yeah. or, or wants to lose a hundred pounds. You know, I've helped, uh, I think about seven people lose over a hundred pounds. Now I pretty much added 20 years on their life doing that. You That's know, true, yeah. what's more rewarding winning a bodybuilding show or giving somebody two decades back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, what gear do you think is not useful? Like what is something you would never put somebody on? Is there anything? I wouldn't say anything because I've used everything. Like I'll even, I'll even in, in some instances use a small dose of DNP if it's really necessary. Really? Yeah. If it's really necessary, I'll run 250 for a couple of weeks baseline. I've never done it. It, it, you know what? It, in high doses, it can really fuck you up. It can really fuck up your kidneys. Uh, but it also has great benefits too. And there's new research coming out that actually shows that it can be beneficial too. It's poison. Of course it is. But so is alcohol. Um, mm. You know, the reason why you get drunk is because you're poisoning your body. So yeah. um, it, it can be bad. Listen, I've probably only, I, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've had somebody use it. Yeah, yeah. Or a couple fingers. But, yeah. but I will use it if necessary. There's nothing that I really won't use except maybe like EPO because yeah. that's just deadly and dangerous. Yeah, yeah, of course. I don't well, like Incrulex. Why, does my, uh, why is my appetite fucked when I take Anadrol? Uh, See, that's that. I, I don't know the answer on that. I have my own solutions that I use. It mm -hmm. could be acidity. It could be the fact that it affects your stomach. It could be the fact that it affects your liver. Yeah. When you're again, when your liver is stressed, you have problem. You have problem digesting fats. Okay. So a lot of people don't realize that when you're on a high fat, high fat diet, you should be taking tutka. Okay. okay. Because it increases bile secretion and helps digest helps fats. Your liver. Yeah. Yeah. So people don't take. Oh shit! Another call. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, people don't take those things into consideration, but uh, off season, I don't like heavy orals. I like orals as plateau breakers. So like when you get people off season, they space their orals out. If you see my off season orals, they're all pre-workout. Okay. Every bit of it is two hours pre-workout and you don't take it on off days. It's strictly a performance enhancer. Makes sense. That makes sense. I've tried that. And I still can't. After like four days, my stomach's just fucked. I can't eat. Watch the messages. Watch the messages you get after this podcast. Cause I've dropped that on other ones and people get crazy feedback because Pre-workout orals are a fantastic plat well, that, plateau breaker. Well, that's always what I've done my orals, pre-workout. I've never... Oh, the whole dose? Yeah, like if I was taking an Anadrol, I would take it usually two hours before training. That's exactly what I have people do. But yeah. you know what? A lot of people break it up because they want steady blood levels. I don't give a fuck about steady blood levels with an yeah. oral because you're not going to get it anyway. Yeah. You know, they'll take 25 in the morning, 25 later. Or if they're taking like 30 milligrams of Anadrol, they do 10 milligrams morning, noon, and night. No, I just throw all in pre-workout and none on off days. Even with your Anavars and stuff. Now, if I'm in, if I have somebody in the last couple of weeks of prep, so I'm using it, it for I'm using it for hardeners, not yeah, for performance. Yeah, yeah. So would that's you, different. Would you use an Anavar in the off season? Uh, yeah, I love Anavar and I love Anadrol. I think Anavar is every bit as strong as Anadrol, milligram for milligram. Really. Absolutely. It's just dry, but you're going to get more collagen. Uh, you're going to get more collagen synthesis upregulation from Anavar. So it's going to strengthen your, it's going to strengthen your tendons and ligaments better. So whereas, should... whereas, whereas Anavar is more of a volumizer. So you're getting more intracellular water and more leverage from it. So I should so, be on Anavar right now. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do when you're older. Yeah. I like Anavar because it keeps you from getting injured. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm But Anadrol yeah. is going to make Anadrol is going to make you stronger because yeah. of the water retention the water. intracellular which is going to lead to leverage, it's going to make you stronger. Yeah. But yeah. Anavar is going to be more dry gains. You're going to get just as good of a muscle growth response, but you're also going to get the benefits of tendons and ligaments. Nice. Okay. I didn't know that either. See, learn something. See, I'm glad I had you on. That could be the Anytime somebody gets injured like I hurt my pec, Anadrol. Really? Anavar speeds up. Anavar speeds up recovery like you wouldn't believe. I gotta fucking down a whole bottle today, then. <laughs> well, again, be careful with your liver. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, all right, Phil. Listen, uh, we've been on for almost a couple hours now. I want to ask you before you go: uh, Is there any message you kind of want to give out to people, kind of as a last kind of thing? I always let people say something kind of before the head off. Is there something that you 
a message you want to give to people as to how to be better or work harder or anything? I mean, I, I don't really judge people's dedication and, and what the, the reasons for doing this. Sometimes it's insecurity. Sometimes it's other reasons. Um, I believe everybody's going to have their own reason to do this or not do it. So, you know, mm -hmm. just follow your heart and that's pretty much it. I don't really have a single message to give to anyone. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not it's that okay. interesting. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, all right. Listen, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, hopefully we'll do it again. We'll get some more X's and O's. We'll get some more tips. Appreciate you having you. me, brother. But thank you very much, man. We'll talk not soon. No problem. Talk all right, soon. man. But right. thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out Hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.